Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book and the AJC Decatur Book Festival, welcome to our penultimate event in the Jocelyn Jackson Summer Reading Series for 2021. We're so happy for you to all join us this evening for this wonderful young adult literature event. And we're just as excited about this event as we hope that you are. A few notes before we begin this evening's event. As with so many of our events, we know that our book community is a very welcoming and accepting community. But we do expect all participants to maintain an atmosphere of respect and fairness. Anyone who violates this standard of behavior, including in any form of harassment, may, at the discretion of our organizers, be immediately removed from this conversation. We know that you all, of course, love books and love our authors. So we don't expect to have to do that this evening. Of course, if you'd like to buy the books this evening, Brave and Kind Books in Decatur is our designated independent bookstore. Our independent bookstores across the country have done so much during this pandemic to get books into our hands by mailing books to homes, providing contactless pickup, and sometimes even delivering books to our doorsteps. So if you don't order from Brave and Kind, we encourage you to order these books from any of our local independent bookstores because they've given us so much, so we would like to give a little back to them. Also, Brave and Kind Books is, of course, a Black-owned, mom-operated bookstore. And we would like to encourage you to not only support Black-owned businesses, but our Black-owned independent bookstores across the country, because we truly believe in a just society and, of course, a diverse literary community. Once again, we are so pleased to partner with the Decatur Book Festival. We were so very happy when Joy Pope reached out to us again this year to partner on this summer reading series and what a summer reading series it's been. Of course, many of you know the Decatur Book Festival was the high point of the beginning of the fall publishing season. And we will be back in some form this year in October. So we hope to see you in this very stripped down version of the Decatur Book Festival. But we do hope that in 2022, we will come back to its full size and fruition. But of course, with that, we do need your help. So if you would like to and feel so inclined, please do donate to the Decatur Book Festival. It's a wonderful chance for book lovers from across the country to come together and visit the great state of Georgia. Right now, I would like to introduce our panelists this evening. Angeline Bully is an enrolled member of the Salt St. Marie tribe of the Chippewa Indians. She is a storyteller who writes about her Ojibwe community in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. She is the former director of the Office of Indian Education at the US Department of Education. Angeline lives in Southwest Michigan, but her home will always be on Sugar Island. Firekeeper's Daughter is her debut novel, which is soon to be adapted at Netflix for TV with President Barack Obama and Michelle Obama's production company, Higher Ground. Once again, joining us is Kelly Quinlan, who is the author of young adult novels, She Drives Me Crazy, Late to the Party, and Her Name in the Sky. A graduate at Vanderbilt University, she is a former teacher. Kelly has also had the joy of speaking to PFLAG groups and high school GSAs. She currently serves as the leadership board of a nonprofit Catholic parents with LGBT children. She lives in Atlanta, Georgia. And of course, we are so pleased to have her return to talk to us this evening. Of course, it goes without saying that our moderator and host tonight is Jocelyn Jackson. She has been a fantastic supporter, not only of the Center for the Book, but the Decatur Book Festival, and is the best-selling author of Mother May I and Never Have I Ever, and I used my really, really punny joke about Between Georgia last week, so I'm not going to try and do that again. But she is here this evening to regale us with, of course, her wit and mirth. So I turn over my duties to Jocelyn Jackson. Thank you, Joe. I'm so excited. I love that we're talking about YA tonight. Um, I'm really excited to have these two excellent writers here. I loved both of these books. No, every time. I'm I'm not, I'm off tonight, y'all. I'm really off. 
Um, I loved both of these books. There's some interest. These are really different books. One is a literary murder mystery, almost a thriller. Um, one is a romantic comedy. I found both of them to be page turners. Um, and the first thing I want to do is let's start with Angeline and say, just tell everybody about your book. Well, my debut novel is Firekeeper's Daughter, and it just came out uh, March 16th. And it follows 18-year-old um, Donna Fontaine, who witnesses a devastating murder. And she has to use her science geekery and also her knowledge about Ojibwe traditional medicines to figure out who is uh, distributing a deadly new drug on her, her reservation. And, um, and she has to, she wants to protect her tribal community before she loses anyone else. That's great. Thank you, Angeline. Kelly, tell us a little bit about She Drives Me Crazy. Yeah, um, She Drives Me Crazy is my third book. It's a rom-com. Um, I like to describe it as kind of an homage to all the great teen rom-coms of the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, but make it gay because um, I never got to see any romantic comedies like that. So it's it's full of tropes. You know, it's got enemies to lovers, fake dating. There's only one bed, which is one of my favorite tropes. Um, and it was, it was kind of like a very fun, campy, indulgent book to write and, and certainly the funniest book I've ever written. So it was, it was a joy to, to tell that story. Both of, in both of these books, you make, you make a choice to have your protagonist be 18 years old um, at the end of senior year. Why, why this period? Why did you choose this time period and these, the lives of these two young women to tell this story? Kelly, let's start with you this time. I don't know that it was a, a conscious choice so much as it's what the story required. Scotty, you know, I, I suppose the, the real answer to that is your senior year of high school is supposed to be this time when you're on top of the world, you've really come into your own, you know, you're the, the big man on campus, so to speak. Um, and Scotty is not feeling that way. She has been dumped by the first girl she was ever in love with, and it has really kind of decimated her sense of self as well as the things that she's good at. So she's no longer good at basketball. She really just feels like adrift. And um, that was kind of a, a cool juxtaposition to explore of what happens when the year that's supposed to be your big year to, you know, go all out and be on varsity everything and, you know, uh, win a senior superlative for the yearbook, things like that what happens when you're actually at, at your worst during that year. And that's, that's what the story required. And so it made, it just worked very well to see how is Scotty going to go on this journey of resilience mm -hmm. to start to finish her senior year in a much healthier, happier place than she started. It also kind of let you skip a bunch of stuff because when you have a protagonist who's that age, you can do things that you you can't do with a 14 year old like there are things that have just been removed from the narrative like this is not a coming out story this right. is a story about a person who's really solidly settled into their identity and comfortable with their sexuality which at 14 is hard and at 18 is not that uncommon mm -hmm. yeah, that yeah i mean i would say that that's um i'd say you'd find that in firekeeper's daughter and she drives me crazy there are mentions of sex and relationships gone wrong and um, scars, literal and metaphorical and, um, and, and some drug and alcohol use. Uh, so, you know, it's funny because Angeline's book is, is much darker in some ways and mine is intended to be a rom-com, but they're both intended for a, a level of maturity that you're right, a 14 year old, it wouldn't work if it was their story. Yeah, that was actually my my segue over to Angeline's book is that we have that we have that that same situation. I mean, where you're there's there's a thing I found very evocative. There's this moment in the book where they go to a party and somebody's drinking. I think it's Mountain Dew 
out of a two liter thing and there's a coffee filter in the Mountain Dew. And I was immediately, so can you talk a little bit about dealing with mature themes? And there's also a really technical reason why you chose 18, but we'll get to that. Let's start here. <laughs> sure. Um, mine was a very deliberate decision. I just think that um, that summer after high school graduation, um, gr high school is this known. You might not have liked it, um, but at least you knew what to expect. And the summer after graduation is this time of like incredible change, whether you're going into the military or, you know, working full time or, you know, um, looking forward to college in the fall. Uh, whatever your situation, it just seems like that summer after graduation is a time of great um, personal uh, transformation, upheaval, like not knowing what the future is going to bring. Um, and, and so it was very deliberate for me to have to focus on that because what Donna's is going through is so much of that. Everything that she thinks she knows, um, everything's all, you know, up in the air. Yeah. I want to just take a quick minute and invite everybody else to join in the conversation. If you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a Q&A button and a chat button. I'm kind of watching both. So if you want to put a question, if you have a question for either one of these authors, please join us. Go ahead, put it in that chat bubble, put it in the Q&A. We will let you come in and be part of the conversation about these books. Um, also, I want to say that um, the best thing you should, the thing that you should do, these are both keeper shelf books. You want to go to that brave and kind link, support your independent bookstore, get a copy of these. They are, they're, they're both dealing with kind of really important, beautiful things for the young people in your life who are struggling with their own identities and coming to terms with stuff, or just trying to do that kind of empathy reading where you read outside your own experience to sort of broaden your understanding of the world. So get these books. Um, I want to stay with Angeline for just a second and say a, a really technical reason why you she had to be 18 is she actually becomes a confidential informant. It's one of yeah. the most interesting aspects of the book. Where did that come from? Can you talk a little bit about that? You picked up on that. Um, yeah, she does sign an agreement to be a confidential informant. And if she were under 18, she would not be able to do that. Um, uh, yeah, when I was 18, I was a senior in high school and my good friend went to a school nearby, different school. And she told me about a new guy. Um, she thought he was my type, but he didn't play sports and he hung out with all the stoners. So that wasn't my type in high school. Um, and it, I never met him. And at the end of the school year, she said that there had been a huge drug bust and it turned out that the new guy had actually been an undercover cop. And I remembered thinking, you know, what if we had met? What if we liked each other? And then this thought was, what if it wasn't that he liked me? What if he needed my help? And so the question that, you know, really stayed in my mind um, before I even considered myself a writer, uh, maybe a storyteller was uh, why would an undercover investigation need the help of an ordinary 18 year old Ojibwe girl? And uh, yeah, I found myself coming up with answers to that question throughout my career. And then finally, when I was 44, I decided to write the indigenous Nancy Drew story that I wished I had read growing up. Oh God, I love that. Um, it's a, it's a pretty, it's, it's a pretty, dark Nancy Drew story but I love that and I don't want to I don't want to do any spoilers but I'm trying to think of how to say this without spoiling while still intriguing people the reasons why she's the perfect choice are they're embedded in the plot they're embedded in the character they're embedded in family reasons it and 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 they sort of unfold as the book goes it's not like oh here's the simple explanation why it works like there's there's twists everywhere, which I just, I just personally love. That's a thing I like. Um, so we have a question from the audience. Callie David says, I'm curious how you both came up with the names for your protagonists. Um, this person has never heard of the name Donis and has never met a girl named Scotty, although it is an IE Scotty. Um, 
So tell me how, how those names are important to me as a writer. Um, Kelly, you want to start? I'm not really sure where Scotty came from. Uh, sometimes characters' first names just pop in your head and they you kind of mull them over and they start to feel familiar. But um, her last name, I wanted something that was more like ethnic Eastern European because I feel like oh, so many times in YA literature, we, we just get the same kind of Anglo names like over and over again. Um, and growing up, like most of my friends had a lot, you know, had like Italian names or Polish names or whatnot. So Scotty's last name, Zajac, is Polish. She's Polish American. Um, and then Irene Abraham, the love interest, she is um, Indian American and her family is from Kerala, which is the southern, it's like the southern western tip of the Indian subcontinent. And there's a lot of um, Christians in Kerala, Keralite Christians. And uh, so I actually did a lot of research and interviewed a couple of my friends whose families are from Kerala to like understand the, the kind of name that Irene might have. And um, it just, it worked out that Scotty was at one end of the alphabet with a Z last name and Irene is at the front of the alphabet with an A last name, kind of just played into them being on opposite ends of the high school food chain and opposites in so many other ways. That's cool. And uh, for me, uh, Donis is an Ojibwe word for daughter. daughter. And because that ties in so heavily with um, her identity and the story, it's dressed up like a thriller, but really it is a coming of age, find, claiming your identity story. And so um, I just felt like that name, there's you know, a reason why her mother insisted on that name for her daughter. And, um, you know. And this is a person who has, I think this is an interesting plot point and it's really early in the book. So it's not a spoiler to talk about like, there is, um, there's a very literal way that she has not, she's not an enrolled member of the tribe. Right, right. So her father's, her father is Ojibwe and her mother is not. Her mother is uh, French and Italian, comes from a very wealthy family in town, and her uh, parents, uh, her grand, you know, Donis's grandparents did not care for Indians, for Native Americans. And so Donis's father's name is not on her birth certificate, which means she can't, you know, could not enroll in the tribe. And so her identity is very much a between two worlds. Um, being so connected to everything and everyone, yet feeling like she's still an outsider. Um, and, and so that was very much a part of, you know, her mother insisting that, uh, that she be named Donis because she knew that her daughter was never going to have her father's last name. And so she wanted her to have that, that first name. And that, and there's a timer on that too. Like if, if, if it's my understanding that if she doesn't take care of this by the time she's 19 she can't do it or right that's what so, I got contextually from the book sure each tribe and there are 574 federally recognized tribes in the country uh they each has the sovereign right to determine their membership uh uh criteria and so in the tribe that Donis belongs to uh you know they cap they would not do new members uh adults to enroll in adults you had to be 18 but before you were 19 um or else you were just shut out i want to remind everybody that we are working tonight with brave and kind books and that is a great there are links over on the side if you want to get either of these books and i would like to tell you that you do you do want to get these books mm -hmm. um kelly and it's also like I know we seem to be coming out the other side, but I want to get out of this pandemic with our independent bookstores alive and intact because otherwise we'll just only be able to get the seven books that are carried in Target and they were all written by someone working for James Patterson. So if you want to be reading voices from all over and you want to be having different stories and you don't want to read the same canned book every time, we've got to take care of our independence. This is how new writers find their audiences. So please go ahead and hit that link in order from Brave, Brave and Kind books. 
Um, so I want to talk about another intersection in these two novels, and that is sports culture is huge here. So uh, we're looking at hockey and basketball, and um, I'm doing this just to make Irene mad. Cheerleading. <laughs> ah! <laughs> you would kill you for that. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm in so much trouble. But 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 also just the kind of alpha behaviors we have with sports and the kind of um, gender and sex issues that we have with sports. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of sports in your books? Anybody can go first. Just jump in there and go. Talk about the importance of sports in your books and how you use that and how that impacts the plot and the development of these two young women. Well, my story is set in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. And if you, if you live in a town that has more pizza places or that has more hockey, um, more ice arenas than pizza places, that's considered a hockey town. And Sault Ste. Marie is definitely that, more ice rinks than pizza places. And so, um, you know, hockey is everything there. And um, Dawnis has been playing competitive hockey her whole life. And she is, um, she played all four years on the boys varsity team in high school. And that's actually based on someone from Sault Ste. Marie who did play all four years, uh, a, a, a girl who played on the boys team. And, and so that gives Donis just this insight into, you know, she's very close with her brother Levi and he, you know, he's a hockey, they call him hockey gods. Um, and, and so it just gives her an end to that whole hockey world, which she deliberately keeps separate from regular world. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of Donis's story is that she's got these, um, this like uh, black or white thinking. So there's her native side and her non-native side. There's hockey world and regular world, um, you know, and and that's how she keeps, um, well, she code switches really. And she holds back parts of herself in order to uh, make people that she's around comfortable and feeling that she's part of that. Um, and so she's constantly, trying to decide if it's safe to be this in this room or safe to be this because of a, um, an incident that happens when she's uh, young and her grandmother, her um, non-native grandmother makes it very clear that it's not okay for her to be um, Ojibwe and that that's a part of herself that she shouldn't be talking about or um, being when she's in her grandmother's presence. And, and so that's very much a part of Donis's uh, fractured identity uh, when she starts the story. Speaking of names, I love the grandmother's name. Grand Mary. Grand yes. Mary. <laughs> because, uh, in French, uh, Grand Mère. And um, because Grand Mary is uh, French and very elitist, uh, you know, has a long, comes from a prominent French family in town that um, of course, her, her, the name she would want Donis to call her is Grand Mary. I loved that. Um, Kelly, talk about sports. Yeah, uh, so She Drives Me Crazy kind of has like two running, uh, not themes, but vehicles that reflect the plot, if you will. So one of them is driving and one of them is sports. And even the title works that way because in basketball you can say that someone drives the lane right um the sports thing really worked because I wanted to look at the ways that romantic relationships can be so performative and almost like playing a game and especially when you go through a breakup sometimes there's this feeling of like who wins the breakup, right? It's a competition. You're competing with your ex. And that's kind of where Scotty is. That's how she ends up in the whole situation with fake dating Irene in the first place is that she's trying to make her ex jealous. She's competing with her ex and she's trying to beat her. Um, so it's interesting because I don't want to spoil the end, but there's toward the end of the book, Scotty literally has to kind of exit the game in a way. And that was you know, that, that was intentional to show that the only way that you really win the game is actually by removing yourself from the game 
and and refusing to play the game. But uh, I'm I'm glad you mentioned the gender stuff too, Joss, because there's a lot of like inherent and explicit sexism and misogyny uh, around cheerleading and around the boys' football team. And even, uh, you know, when we got to copy edits with this book, the copy editor from Macmillan, in the very first few pages, Scotty talks about how their defensive formation, they're playing man to man, which is what you would call it when you stick to one opponent rather than doing zone defense. Mm -hmm. And so the copy editor from Macmillan said, do you want to change this to say woman, woman on woman or woman, you know, whatever. And I said, no, I like specific, I know that it says man to man. And yes, that did occur to me. And I want to leave that in there to kind of increase that friction of girls playing sports in this world that still uses masculine language all the time. And yes. And it's, it's, there's, you know, it's not just is, is a cheerleader an athlete, but who gets cheered for? Like there's a big thing in the book, like, yeah. Who, who, where, do, where are the cheerleaders going to do their cheering? What teams get the varsity attention of the cheerleaders? And then are those cheerleaders athletes, which yes, yes, they are. They are, but that's, that's like one of the first stats that Scotty and Irene have is who are they performing for cheerleaders? Are they performing for themselves or are they performing for, as Scotty says, whatever boys team we're worshiping that night? And I love that Irene kind of calls Scotty out on it and is like, oh, aren't you such a bastion of feminism tearing down other girls when you're trying to make a point about misogyny? And um, that's why the two of them are, are just so good to play off of each other, pun intended, play off of each other. Um, because you, it is, that's so often how it works, like in any minority community is rather than pushing up against the aggressor you push against other minorities and so I, I was like I didn't want it to be girl versus girl and you know ultimately they're both athletes they both win in a sense and um yeah I kind of just wanted a backdrop in a context of boys sports being the important sports and yet the girls the girls sports throughout this book end up becoming more important and Irene does change the cheerleading schedule to cheer for the girls, but not before first asking Scotty, why haven't you ever asked us to cheer for your team? Which fair, fair. Yeah, cool. totally fair. Um, we are getting some good questions. I want to remind everybody who's here with us tonight, if you put your questions in the Q&A or in the chat, I will find it and you can join this conversation with us. Right now, I want to go to Isadora's question. I think it's great. What scene was the most difficult for you personally to write? Angeline, let's start with you. Do you need a second? Yeah, I do. I do. Kelly, if Kelly can go first, I need to think about it. Um, for me, it was um, difficult in an emotional sense to deal with the fallout from Scotty's toxic breakup. Um, I took a lot I mined a lot from my own heart and my own emotional um, map to put that emotional truth in the story of what it feels like when you break up with someone and you still love parts of them or even all of them. And yet you realize that they're toxic at the same time, that kind of cognitive dissonance that happens. And I actually thought that there was some really good overlap with Fire Keeper's, Keeper's daughter, and she drives me crazy as well, the whole conversation with Travis and Lily about like, what's a healthy relationship and like codependency and all that, because eventually Scotty and Irene run up against that wall as well, where it's like, hey, we're not gonna be together if you can't get your shit together. Like your own stuff, you need to handle yourself. And there's a line after Scotty has decided that she needs to focus on her own healing where she says, before you can worry about who's in your passenger seat, you have to learn to drive yourself. And to me, that kind of summarizes the whole theme of the book. And, uh, but it, that was hard for me to write. It took a lot out of me emotionally to kind of go back and reopen those wounds and reflect on the ways that breakups can hurt us as, as young people, even, and even as older people. I, I, I would say um, the emotional scenes of grief, 
especially in that immediate aftermath. Um, uh, 25 years ago, my sister, who you know was 29 and I was 31, um, was killed in a car accident. And just this beautiful, vibrant person to be here one minute and gone the next. Um, and you know, my family's never been the same since. You know, and um, there were odd things that would happen um, where I would pick up the phone to call her and ask her like, are you coming over for dinner tonight? Um, do you need me to pick up the boys from, you know, daycare? And then realizing she's not going to answer that. And, um, and my mom kept the phone number for a couple of months because she just liked calling and hearing my sister's uh, voicemail or answering machine. And just the rawness of that and remembering, you know, that, but also feeling like I wanted to write about it because um, there are better days and um, the ones that we lose, they, you know, they're still with us every time we remember them, when we hear their voices telling us, you know, I, I, my sister scolds me all the time about stuff like, come on. And I just, I know exactly what she would say to me in certain situations. And, and that has, instead of being a source of um, sadness, which it was in the beginning, it's now a source of like comfort and connection. Like, I know what she would tell me to do. She'd tell me, you know, she'd kick my butt and want me to go do this and this and this. And, and it um, makes me feel good, like that I didn't, I didn't lose everything about her. And, and so I just, that's one of the, one of the main themes of my story is about identity, grief, and justice. And, and so that's, it was hard to write about it, but I'm, I'm glad that I did. I'd give anything if I didn't have that to not have that experience. Yeah, to not have that would be so much better, but I'm so glad that you found that way to connect with your sister. That's very, very beautiful. Um, and I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. Um, you're both writing about Generation Z. I'm Gen X. <laughs> I don't know how we ended up with, I guess the Y became millennials. So, and I think Gen, <laughs> I think that, um, and I, I don't want to make any presumptions about what you're, what, what you are, but I would say you're probably both millennials. Yes. Different ends of the spectrum of millennials. Maybe no. Are you Gen X Do you? Wow. You look great. I'm Gen X, like on the cusp of baby boomer. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. No, I would never have guessed that. Um, but so, so you're, you're Gen X and a millennial writing Gen Z, which is a very different, these are, these people are so weird, man. I, my daughter is Gen Z. My son is a zillennial. They're so weird and they're so beautiful. They're so emotionally available in ways that I I find shocking. And I think that both of these books, that's really present, especially in the friendships. I want you to talk a little bit about the best friend relationships um, that are present in these two books because they are, I found them to be very moving and just the the truthfulness that was there and the openness and the the um uh the articulation of their um, their th th these Gen Z people are so in touch with their own they can articulate their emotions which is completely foreign to me <laughs> but I see it in this generation and the two of you who are not Gen Z have made me recognize Gen Z in this book so I want you to talk about like writing across a generational divide, how you get to that point and the best friend relationships in these two books. Sure. Well, I always worked with um, tribal teens in all the different communities that I, you know, that I've worked in. Um, I've worked for a number of different Indian tribes. And so I always, um, 
you know, got to know some of the teens and, and then my own kids were teens when I started writing and um, just listening to my boys. I'll, I'll tell this one story. So one time I'm sitting at the family computer in the family room and my, my oldest boy is very social. So he's got all of his friends over and they're just goofing off. I don't know. Boys are just teen boys. And um, all of a sudden I hear, ow, ow. And I, I'm like, what the heck is going on? They had taken a disposable camera and had worked the, had rewired it to make it into a homemade taser. And they were tasering each other. And I was like, what in the, what in the hell are you doing? And um, they had learned about it on the internet. And so I like took it from them. And I, I was just like, I, I cannot believe that this is what you're doing. But man, <laughs> I learned a lot about how teen boys talk. I guess at a certain point, if you're sitting at the computer for eight hours and the boys are like in and out, in and out, uh, you, hear, you overhear a lot of things sometimes that you wish you didn't. Um, so, and then the best friend, well, I've, I've talked about my sister, Sarah, yeah. and she was my best friend. And she would tell me like, if I had lipstick on my teeth, or if I was wearing something that was not a, you know, that was a fashion don't she, she would let me know. Um, but she also fiercely loved me and had my back no matter what. And she was younger than me and cooler than me. So I was like in awe of my younger sister. So um, just that ability to be completely honest with someone and to have that level of trust that you can say um, things that from anyone else might be hurtful, but when it's coming from your best friend, you're like, yeah, you're right. You know, those jeans don't look that good, but you know, <laughs> that's what I'm wearing today. So yeah, that's, that's my bit on teens and, um, and best friends. Kelly? I don't actually try to write for Gen Z. I, I mean, I'm only one generation above them. But, you know, it's been 15 years since I graduated high school. Uh, so it does feel far away in some ways. And then it also doesn't. But I just try and write um, in a kind of a, a universal way that that young people in general would be able to connect with. I know that sounds really like authory, but um, I, I think I've learned my lesson from, <laughs> from trying to appeal to Gen Z because even when I wasn't trying to do it in late to the party, when I like snuck in like Tumblr references and stuff, because I'm on Tumblr, I would get Gen Z reviewers that were like, oh, this is like so uncool. Like stop with the Tumblr references. And I was like, oh God, this is like, like they're terrifying. Gen Z is terrifying. They will like drag you over the coals. Uh, so I, uh, I don't, tr I try to actively not pander to them is the point I'm trying to make. And I stick to that emotional truth of what it's like to be an adolescent and be in this liminal space as Angeline is talking about. And uh, I think that that just comes through in these characters. And certainly it comes through for, for Scotty and her best friend, Danielle, and for Irene and her best friend, Honey Bell, who is like probably my favorite character. I've ever love known. her. He's a loon, but if like- If you don't love Honey Bell, I can't even with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've loved the reception, like from readers of Honey Bell. Like I, I knew people would love Irene because I'm obsessed with Irene. But the the fandom for Honey Bell is like, I love it. I love it so much. It's uh, real. She's so out. She's just right out there. Just uh, rip, yeah. Remove. Here's this. Um. So I I just gotten a note from the Georgia Center for the Book. I did not know this, but this is very cool. If you purchase from Brave and Kind Books, there are signed book plates available while supplies last, which turns this book into a, a great gift as well as a book. You, and like, I'm not saying that you should do this. I'm just saying you could just read it very carefully. And then you have a beautiful side book to pass on to someone else. Not that I would ever ever do that myself. We're getting a lot of questions from the audience, so I'm going to go there for a little bit. Um, oh, Kelly Roberts 
has a question. Um, I loved the elders in Firekeeper's Daughter. Can Angeline talk about writing their parts? I know uh, Kelly loved them too. So she's I mentioned this before we started. My favorite scene <laughs> had to do with the elders. <laughs> there is a Granny June fandom out there that is just, yeah. Um, Granny Dune is a character and she's based on my cousin Elaine's grandma and um, I would take her I would drive her around to garage sales to look for hardcover James Mishner books um, that part is very much real and she would always start every conversation with me as if we were in the middle of an argument like she would just start she would see me and just start yelling at me and at first, you know, when I first moved back to Sault Ste. Marie and I was hanging out, you know, uh, I, I worked um, with our elders in, for, as part of my work. And um, I would go eat lunch with them, like, at, you know, at least once a week. And just to get yelled at um, as a way of introduction, you know, of saying hello, uh, that always cracked me up. And then just the dry humor and, Whenever I would miss my dad, my parents are still alive, but they, you know, we live downstate now and my tribe is in the Upper Peninsula. So when I lived and worked there, I would miss my parents. And so I would eat lunch with my dad's friends because they would laugh at the same things. And I would just feel close to my dad, like my dad would be laughing. And so um, I just felt it was so important to show like, our elders are so vibrant and they're part of our community and they have so much to share and give. And I just, and that they're not um, stagnant. Like they, they like our culture, like they adapt, they figure things out. My dad got an iPad at like 76 or something. And he's on his iPad now more than, you know, uh, than any of my teens, you know, than any of my kids are. So just, I just really wanted to show that love and appreciation uh, for our. She is kind of gold goals because she's so. She gives no craps. She, yeah. if she feels like it should be said, she's going to say it. And she also has like, I found like some of the things Donna's didn't know about her that we learned as we went along. I found to be huge. I don't want to spoil it, but hugely just affecting and just lit her up like she's she's not just you know this sassy lady like there's all these layers and depths to her and you see where she comes from and she's not like a huge character but she's so well drawn I loved her too. she is she a is yeah um Kelly I want to talk with you just for a second about hey it's June what's June June oh it's it's pride month it's it is it's right to read a book where two girls are holding hands on the cover <laughs> would you look at that talk a little bit about the importance of books like this you this is uh do you kind of feel this almost as a calling yeah i to do tell these stories that weren't there for you yeah i think so i mean i think that there's i think that's one of the best things about a lot of the young adult books that are taking off now is so many of them are intersectional stories and mm -hmm you know, like Angelina is saying, indigenous Nancy Drew that she didn't get. And I didn't get a John Hughes rom-com that was for lesbians, you know? Um, and I, I love that we're getting to so be many- fair, We didn't really get a, a John Hughes rom-com that was for straight all. girls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is for boys, but anyway. You're right. You're right. Um, but even like when, you know, I was coming of age in the early 2000s and we didn't have them then either, you know, even with 10 things I hate about you and all those great rom-coms. So um, it's it's funny, I was on a panel for the Pride Book Fest a few weeks ago and it was with, I called them the godparents of LGBT YA books. It was um, Alex Sanchez, David Levithan and Melinda Lowe. And we were kind of talking about the evolution of queer YA through just through the last 20 years or so, because mm -hmm. it has not been very, it's been very recent that we've really started getting a lot of YA um, LGBT books. And it's really wonderful that we're starting to get to a point now where I actually have decision fatigue about which LGBT YA book I want to read next. You know, I have so many, I've, I'm looking at a pile over there 
that I have to read that I want to read this month. And there's like eight of them. And I don't even know which one to start with. And they're all queer young adult. And it's, um, it's a wonderful problem to have because it used to be, you know, you could read the whole canon in a matter of months and now- Patience and Sarah and you're done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Only on my mind, the end. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's, I think it's really wonderful. And some of the best, uh, stuff I've heard from readers is that they appreciate that this is not a coming out story. Neither Scotty nor Irene has to come out to their parents. There's no coming out trauma. It's, it's all just the, the structure of a rom-com, the tropes of a teen rom-com, and incidentally, the two leads are both girls. Wow. And yeah, and I, I think that we are getting to that place in our culture where we do need more stories like that. And that doesn't mean that we don't still need, sorry, we don't still need coming out narratives because we do. And we especially need more intersectional coming out narratives. I Um, I can't, like I was posing this question to my friend Leah Johnson who wrote, um, you should see me in a crown. And we were saying like, have we had a really, a really standout um, queer indigenous YA? I'm not, I'm not sure. Like, but the fact that we have to stop and think about it, that just shows me that there's so much more room to grow. And I'm, I'm hoping that we are going to continue to get more of these stories. I, 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 I do too. I, I think it's that we, there's something got started, I guess, I guess you're right. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not very grounded in space and time to be quite honest. I know yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly's known me for a while. I'm not very grounded in space and time, but it's been kind of a recent feeling that, and I, I think there's a trickle down effect in pop culture too. And in some ways, books are the most old fashioned things like intersectionality. It took longer to get to books than anything else. And just also like, you know, it's, it's, only been a couple of decades since you could have a gay love story that didn't end in suicide or horror like this has a pretty I don't want to spoil the ending but it is a rom-com you're not going to need antidepressants I'll tell you that um all right we're going to go to some more audience questions um so many people in the chat are saying yes I love Honey Bell oh I love the elders like all of these people are affirming everything that you guys are talking about and my favorite person in the audience said, I just read a library copy of Firekeeper, Firekeeper's Daughter, but now I bought a copy from Brave and Kind because this is definitely a keeper book. So yeah. be like that guy. Um, <laughs> Maya Todd wants to know if there's a message you want people to get from reading your books or what do you want people to come away with when they finish your book? And is that your job? I don't think it's our job to be prescriptive. I don't either. Um, but I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Yeah, it is. I mean, because it's like, what are the the ethical responsibilities of telling stories, especially for young people? And where's the line between what we're responsible for and what we're not? Um, I always hope that people come away from reading one of my books and they feel seen. Like they feel oh, that they great. have found a part of themselves in the story and in the characters. And I think that every great young adult protagonist does that. You know, I connected to Donis and she is a very relatable character because all of us have felt that we're not enough of something or the other, or we're, you know, we're too much of one thing or we're, she, she exists in so many liminal places in her identity. And um, I have, I feel that way too. And, and I hope that the books that I write have characters that feel human and feel known and feel relatable. And also I hope that they feel imperfect in a lot of ways, you know, in, in She Drives Me Crazy, Scotty is kind of a disaster lesbian to use a, a cultural term. Like she makes a lot of mistakes. Like she's kind of an idiot. And there are times when she definitely crosses the line with what she says to Irene. And it's, you know, can we forgive her for that? You know, she's hurting, she's healing. Can, can, it, can she be redeemed by herself and by other people? And I, I hope that, that seeing a story like Scotty's makes people feel loved for who they are as imperfect humans. I think that's, I think that's fair. 
Angela? Well, I made a very deliberate craft decision to write uh, Donis' story, first person point of view, present tense, so that the reader was inside Donis' head and Donis was raised with Ojibwe language, um, speaking it. And, and so that's just a part of how she thinks. And so that's why um, there is a lot of Ojibwe language in the story and it's very organic. There's not a glossary. It's like you, the, I challenge the reader to figure it out through context. Um, but, uh, you know, but it really I, is supported. Like you support it contextually. It's it, and your yeah. world building is exquisite. Yeah. Like I was so present in this very. I don't even think I've ever been to the Upper Peninsula. I don't know. You know, like this was this whole world, both of the worlds that she inhabits. Well, she inhabits more than two, but because. Sugar Island feels very real and yeah. and and the, both of these worlds are very unfamiliar to me and you never were like and now I'm going to patiently set the scene for you you just pushed me into it but it's so rich and well imagined mm -hmm. that it, it's not hard to pick it up contextually at all thank you very much Sugar Island powwow is July 17th and 18th on Sugar Island um you know, I just, I think that I wanted, I want readers to take away that we Indigenous people are still here. We are here, we are present, and our stories are so um, uh, diverse and complex. And I just wanted people to see us, um, to see my kids, my teen, you know, and the teens that I've worked with and know, um, I just wanted us to be real people and not caricatures or stereotypes or noble, you know, the whole like noble savage uh, dichotomy. Um, you know, I wanted us to have native villains and native protagonists and a protagonist that you know, screws up a lot and um, isn't perfect. And sometimes she really makes some big mistakes. And I, I just wanted her to be real, be real to people. You know what um, book I wish I could have read in tandem with Firekeeper's Daughter? I mean, I still read them a year apart. Jocelyn, you know this author, uh, Caitlin Curtis's- Native. Master, Native. Yes. Have you read that, Angeline? No, I have not. Oh, oh. I read that last oh, summer during okay. quarantine, and it was so beautiful. And well, Joss can speak more to her. I don't know her personally, but she's, I think her mother's side is white and her father's side is native. Oh, okay. she, she wrote this like whole spiritual meditation on bringing her Christianity and her native beliefs together. And it was just such a powerful reflection. And the ultimate takeaway that I got from reading that book is Native Americans are not a thing of the past. You know, they are still here and still very much alive in culture. And anyway, I was so glad I, I read that and read by the Keeper's Daughter somewhat close together. <laughs> Brave and Kind Bookstore, can, that would be a great book to read in tandem with this book. You should <laughs> get both, they're small. Um, <laughs> I know we're, okay, we're almost out of time. So we're gonna go into the speed round to get the rest of the questions done from our audience. So you have like four sentences to go. Actually, I know the answer, I think, but I'm just gonna read it straight and we'll start with Angela in this time. Um, how did you come up with this title? And I mean, this title, your title's connection to the book is really super clear, but like, were there other titles in the mix or was it always this? It was always this. Um, not only is it, I had her father's last name be Firekeeper. So it's like literally Firekeeper's daughter. My dad is a firekeeper. Uh, he takes care of some ceremonial fires. So I am literally a Firekeeper's daughter. Um, but there's also a cultural um, teaching about Firekeeper's Daughter starting this, uh, lifting the sun every day with a song to 
effect in the East. And, and that plays into the story as well. I, I also want to say one thing I just loved about your book that is so unpresent. And it's, I almost feel like people's, I, I think we're trying beings. I think we're in relationship with a body, mind, and a spirit. And I always say like prayer is like going to the bathroom. You never see it happen in a book. <laughs> and I loved that Donis was so invested in her own spirituality. And that was so present throughout the book. And it was so inviting and interesting. I loved that. Yeah. Kelly? Oh, sorry, you go. Oh, I was going to say, and Donis um, has her period in the book. And it's yes. kind of this like, you know, no other point of the story, just that, you know. Yeah, I love that line time. something like he pretends not to notice that I bled on the sheets and I pretend not to notice his morning boner <laughs> <laughs> I was like yeah. yes <laughs> and it's just this like normalness you know so I just wanted to have it in there and not have it be this huge deal mm -hmm. I, she drives me crazy. Title, was there ever another title in the mix or was it always this? Yes. Yeah, so my working title was uh, Scotty and Irene and everything in between. And I knew while I was working on it, I was like, McMillan's not going to like this. And so I had started brainstorming other titles. And then when Makisha, my editor, came to me, she's like, so we're thinking something different. I just, I texted her back right away, or emailed back right away. And I said, how about she drives me crazy? Like I just had it ready to go. And then she wrote back, she's like, oh, that's perfect. Um, and it is catchier and it does connect to pop culture. And I do want to say it is not a reference to the Britney Spears song, which is you drive me crazy. A lot of millennials and Gen Zers have thought it's that. It's the fine young cannibal song from the eighties. That's my era, that's my jam. Okay, so I picked, <laughs> part of the reason I love that song is because so I was born in 1988 and I guess that song was really big then. And I was my parent, <laughs> look at Angela and she's like, no, this yeah. is not right. Uh, um, killing me, I, was Kelly my parents, I was my parents' first kid and my dad used to like dance around with me to that song and sing that about me because I was this baby keeping them up all night and driving them crazy. And so this book is dedicated to my mom who I think is still here tonight. Hi mom, I love you. Um, the dedication is to my mom, but the title was kind of for my dad. I do want to say that's a very Gen Z thing, this sort of past appropriation. I remember when my 13-year-old daughter came to introduce me to her new favorite musician, David Bowie. <laughs> run, child, run! <laughs> You're not going to introduce me to David Bowie. Um, I want to say this has been delightful. You guys are just, I just don't even know how you can be as delightful as your books, but you are. I've so enjoyed this conversation. These are keeper shelf books, support Brave and Kind bookstore. You can order them and they're, they have a limited number of signed book plates. Thank you guys so much for being here. I've loved- Can I just say, the year that Kelly was born, I graduated from college. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm on that cusp of Gen, what? Uh, oh, Gen you X. You seem to have lost and, connection with Kelly. <laughs> and, yeah. you know what, I've got your number. <laughs> oh, thank you guys yeah. both for being here. Everybody, thank you for being here. Last, This is the penultimate. We will finish out the series next week. There's all the, we're out of time, out of time, but there's all the information about that in the chat. Thank you guys all for being here and we'll see you next week.